Past performance may not be indicative of future results. Therefore, no current or prospective client should assume that the future performance of any specific investment, investment strategy, including the investments and or investment strategies recommended and or purchased by advisor or product made reference to directly or indirectly will be profitable. Different types of investment involve varying degrees of risk and there can be no assurance that any specific investment will either be suitable or profitable for a client's investment portfolio. No client or prospective client should assume that any information presented serves as the receipt of or substitute for personalized investment advice from the advisor or any other investment professional. Welcome to the Bullington Capital Report, hosted by Bill Bullington. For the next hour, you'll receive information on current market conditions and trends that could affect your financial future. If you have a question, you can participate in today's program by calling 216-901-0945. That's 216-901-0WHK. You can also reach Bill by going to his website, BullingtonCapital.com. And now, here's Bill Bullington. Well, welcome back, everybody. <clears throat> Been an uh, interesting week. By the way, the month of August is typically the... Worst month for stock market return. So we are right almost smack in the middle um, and uh, it's almost over. So that should be pretty good. And uh, so today we're going we're gonna to talk about the market a little bit, uh, how you might be able to make more money by, uh, by the way, making more money in this case is going to be by understanding what's going on in the marketplace right now. Um, this is not unusual. It's very frustrating. We'll get to that in just a second. But uh, then we're going to cover uh, fixed income, which is actually done very well. Um, relative, well, it depends on where you're invested, I guess, I should say. But some fixed income opportunities, uh, options that are available that you might be able to incorporate with the rest of your uh, retirement income plan if you're at that level. And if you're going to be at that level in the next 10 years, uh, there's a really good product out there that will tell you, they'll give you a schedule of how much you could expect to receive anywhere from one year from now to 10 years from now. And that schedule is then guaranteed. And uh, um, anyway, we'll, get, we'll talk more about that later in today's show. And if you have any questions, uh, the number to call is 216-901-0945. 1945 I'm going to take the last 15 minutes of today, and I'm going to talk about individual stocks. So the last 15 minutes, I've had a lot of people requesting that I would talk about individual stocks because I used to talk a lot about it. Uh, quite frankly, it's gotten a lot harder. Markets move fast. I mean, it, they were fast when I was young in the business, but they're faster now. And uh, the volatility is intense, um, but I still like it. And I still run the same scans I've ran my entire life at least two or three times a week. And um, so anyway, we'll talk a little bit about that and where, I might, where we might see some opportunities in, uh, because there still are some. It, it's a lot more difficult right now. The S&P 500 makes up about half of the market's uh, stock market value. But the way that they invest in those stocks they're heavily overweighted in the top 50 stocks, so the top 50 stocks make up like half. And that's not good, actually. That, there's, an all, there's all kinds of risk involved with doing something that way. And it's great when it's working because it will typically outperform almost everything else. And when it starts to, to correct, um, look out. You know, so that's... We'll talk a little bit more about that, too, uh, later in today's show. And before I, I actually start, I did want to take a few minutes to talk about uh, the Cleveland Grays Armory. Uh, they're actually a nonprofit organization, and uh, they're dedicated to preserving Ohio history and offering support to our country's active military and veterans. They are a tax-exempt nonprofit 501c3 organization, and they've got a... Uh, Federal tax identification number if you want to call me and get it if you ever wanted to make a donation there. However, if you don't want to donate, 
the uh, you can always go to this. Uh, I believe it's a called a T. Anyway, at, on September October first. So uh, I'm, on September October <laughs> on Sunday October first. The Cleveland Grays will be hosting their third annual historic tea. Yes, it is a tea. The event is expected to draw over 120 attendees and will feature a presentation by Patty Edmondson, Museum Advisory Curator of Costume and Textiles for the Western Reserve Historical Society, entitled Tying the Knot, A History of Western Wedding Fashion, Highlighting Wedding Fashion and Tradition. The event's going to be held at the Cleveland Gray's Armory Museum, located at 1234 Boulevard Val- uh, Road. That's 1234 Boulevard Road, Cleveland, Ohio, 44115. The proceeds will go to benefit the Cleveland Gray's. They've got a really uh, nice museum there, and it's amazing that that building was built in the late 1800s. It's still there. Uh, it's in great shape. And it's fun to go in and walk around and, and look at all the stuff there. In fact, I think the they've got this big organ, uh, like like one of the really old black and white movies. <laughs> you would see these big organs in these houses. But uh, they host weddings there. And um, uh, I know the Gray's Armory has a bunch of stuff that they like to do uh, every year. There's a shooting range in the basement. Uh, that will be closed that day, I'm sure. <laughs> But anyway, uh, if you're interested in supporting this event and the preservation of Ohio history, please contact Mary Olenek at 216-392-8687. That's 216-392-8687. You can also mail donations to the Cleveland Gray's Army, Armory Museum, Attention Historic Tea Committee, 1234 Boulevard Avenue, or Boulevard Road, rather, Cleveland, Ohio, 44115. Now, if you didn't get that and you want me to send you the information, then uh, just feel free to do that. And uh, I think this tea is generally open to the public. So if you just wanted to go in and take a look, that's pretty cool. And there are sponsorships. So you can sponsor tables there uh, if you'd like to do that as well. And uh, I think the easiest thing is probably just try, give me a call because I've scanned these documents, and you can buy the uh, tickets online. There's a uh, website called Eventbrite, uh, or you can mail them in either way. And it's just a lot of fun. There's the, uh, I've been to a couple of these, and they are a lot of fun. And it's amazing. And I'm trying to think of the, uh, this guy was a famous conductor. Oh, man, I've got clients that are going to be really mad at me for forgetting this guy's name. Anyway, he was super famous. And he was in Cleveland to conduct their orchestra uh, in this building. Uh, I think it's, I can't even remember. I'll, I'll have to look that up. I apologize. Yeah, but it was. It is pretty neat. The, the building is largely the way it was when they built it. And when you see a lot of the cabinetry in there, it's done by hand. Those guys were doing that by hand. It, it was mind-boggling. Uh, so and it's right here in Cleveland. It's actually, if you're going to uh, one of the Indians games, you can just park in their parking lot uh, and go down the street. That'd be don't tell them I told you to do that. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, uh, so again, if you want any information on that, feel free just to hit me up, and I will be glad to send you all these scanned documents that tells you all, all about it. And if you want to join uh, the Cleveland Grays, um, it's a very low membership fee. The fund goes to keep the building uh, intact and, and uh, safe, and uh, they've got an awful lot of stuff in there outside of what I've talked about. I don't have enough time to talk about everything that they do there. But anyway, I just think it's a really nice organization. Uh, it's downtown Cleveland, something fun to do. It's not expensive. And again, if you want more information on that, just give me a call and uh, or just email me, and it's bill at bulletincapital.com. So I'll get back to finance now. <laughs> and uh, one of the uh, things I like to do, is I, we have a, a newsletter service, and I'm able to edit the newsletters, and I get to select the articles that will go out to my clients. And I think that's pretty cool. Uh, if you would like to be included on that list, 
And uh, again, you can go to my website and just sign up for it. There's no cost, um, and we're not. Nobody will call you uh, because you signed up for it. The, uh, I haven't heard enough time to calling back the people that want me to talk to them. <laughs> but uh, it's a lot. Yeah, I didn't think I'd have to work this hard at this age, but uh, but I like it. I, I really do. So anyway, this um, this newsletter uh, we sent out. Uh, the first article, by the way, is is good news, finally good news again. And they're talking about the economy and how it's a little bit um, – uh, there are certain parts of the economy that are doing well and certain parts that aren't doing as well as they thought they would do. But there is momentum across most of the major industry groups, uh, which means that they're, um, they're doing pretty well. And – by raising interest rates, what the federal government's trying to do is – they're not doing this out of the kindness of their heart, by the way. It, it, it's nice that you have higher interest rates. It's nice that the lifetime income for a 67-year-old who invested 100000 bucks when they were 66 is $7,154. That's what I was talking about with the annuity. So if you had put $100,000 in and 12 months later you could turn the income on, uh, you're going to get $7,154 for the rest of your life. Uh, if your beneficiary is there, they'll collect for the rest of their lives. Uh, the, the amount may change depending on your age, so you got to kind of uh, figure that out. That, that you'd have to call me for. But uh, bottom line is somebody's going to get $7,154 for the rest of their lives, no matter what happens in the stock market and what, are, what happens in the bond market. Uh, as long as Nationwide's there to be able to, to pay that bill. And uh, one of the reasons I kind of stick to A-plus rated companies because I, I just don't want any trouble with the credit there. And, and they can do this fairly easily. There's some advantages. We'll have to talk about that on a future show. But uh, anyway, if you didn't need to take it, it would actually go up from 7,154 to 7,824 when you turn 68. Okay. When you got to 70, it would go all the way up to 9,257. And again, remember, this is not a typical income annuity. This you're going to get this income, and if you don't, if you got in an automobile accident or you know um, passed away before you spent the money that you'd invested, this is one of the fewer products out there that will refund the balance to your family. A lot of you may have heard of annuities, income annuities, and some of them, once the uh, person that bought the annuitant, once the annuitant passes away, the insurance company can keep the rest of the money. So you got to, you really have to watch, you know, read the contracts, and talk to someone that's got a lot of experience in this business, because there are a lot of different ways to go, and uh, there are lots of benefits and features uh, that uh, may not be applicable to you, uh, like the the ones that where the insurance money keeps the money after you pass away, well, that what happens if you you know you died a year later? Well, that's one of the reasons that they were paying more, be, uh, typically paying more because you know you're you're basically giving that money away just for the guarantee of the income. That's not how this one works. If you get the income on this and then you pass away, the money's been invested actually, and they're showing you the account balance. If the account balance is is lower than what you put into it minus what you've taken out, they'll make up that difference to your beneficiary. So that's pretty cool. Um, if you, uh, again, if you want more information on that, feel free to hit me up. I, I, we can talk about it. It's free. Uh, the, the tone of voice I'm using now is a tone of voice I always take. So one of the worst things in the world is a high-pressure salesperson, I think. Yeah, and I'm not. I don't know that that's as popular as it was when I was a younger man. I can, I can remember, you know, nobody wanted to talk to anybody because they were afraid that uh, somebody was going to really lean on them hard, you know, to try to make a sale. And that's not how we work. We're we're in uh, fiduciaries. We have to do what's in your best interest. And uh, sometimes that's hard to figure out. Incidentally, um, the more money you have, the easier it is to figure out. You know, because you have more flexibility, and it's those um, people, and there are, there are a lot of people out there where, where it's going to be close to be able to make it. You know, to be able to live that comfortable lifestyle 
uh, that they're hoping for in retirement. That is not an easy task. And sometimes it's incredibly complicated. Most of the time, it's not. And I've got a couple minutes here before I have to take a quick commercial break. But we're going to talk about that, how to uncomplicate your financial plan, um, particularly if you're getting close to retirement. It doesn't have to be super complicated. A lot of people make it that way unnecessarily. And there are things that you can do to try to simplify that. And uh, I'm a, I am a big fan of the simpler, the better. Uh, and I know if you've listened to this show for any length of time, you've probably heard me talk about Occam's Razor. Occam was a priest, and he was uh, famous for the saying that the simplest solution is often the best. And that's true. The simplest solution is often the best. And if you can really take a look at things and try to simplify it, break it down, uh, it just makes it so much easier to live your life, uh, less complicated. And, uh, yeah, you come to you come to my house, it, my house looks like a hospital. I don't have anything in there that I don't absolutely need. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, the, uh, the, the minimalist in me is uh, well at work, and I'll try to help you uh, understand you know, what your options are. And by the way, some things... You just they're just naturally complicated. If you've got a pension from Oprah's, uh you guys that know who Oprah's is know what I'm talking about. Unbelievable how much complication there is in that. And they get upset by that. Yeah, uh, when you when they hear somebody say that, oh no, it's not that oh yeah, it is. It is. Believe me. <laughs> we'll talk about why that is when we come back from these commercial messages. This is Bill Bullington. I'm right here on 1420. Stay tuned because I'm going to be right back. Sometimes I wonder, is he faithful? Does he see me in my truck? Welcome back, and as usual, I have uh, lost my lost track of my place and my radio show. <laughs> oh man, it's a good thing that I'm not a professional radio broadcaster because I would have been fired a mul- you know, multiple times. I would have never been on the radio this for this length of time. Anyway, we were talking a little bit about the uh, fixed index annuity that I like the best, and. Uh, um, how that gives you a, a guaranteed income. If you don't need the income, it'll go up each year, and it's guaranteed. Now, that, see, that's a that's a big deal. That's a very competitive product. The interest rate is wonderful, and because uh, when you look, uh, I, let's compare this to the stock market. It's not a good comparison because they are two entirely different uh, investment categories, but. If you had put your money in the uh, S&P 500 two years ago, it's 6.63% below that level from two years ago. Uh, And the reason I'm uh, bringing this up, I've I've been doing a lot of work lately, uh, and I'll be working on this stuff for the next 12 months, no sweat. But we're doing comparisons. Uh, I'm trying to build some products that uh, are consultative products that I can roll out to the general public where they can come in and do some analysis. Um, It's it's a work in progress. And this is one of the things that that I was looking at. A lot of people are are upset because they're hearing from the media, and uh, most of the media is the, uh, man, it's just rough. Media is saying, oh, this docs are at a, a, a new one year high. Well, yeah, but they're still below where the all time high was two years ago. <laughs> and it just kills me how they say that stuff. And and by the way, the people that are writing that and this is like, you know, well, Wall Street Journal's not as um prone to make those kind of statements because they do know a lot about finance, but 
you'll you'll still read it. And CNBC, they quite frankly, uh, I don't waste my time watching that anymore because they're talking about that constantly. I'm like, guys, do you not realize that the general public sooner or later is going to go look up a chart or somebody like me is going to show them one? And when you guys are saying, hey, the market's making a new one-year high uh, or a new high for the year, okay, but if it's still down from where it was two years ago and you're not telling people that, you're creating a false sense of excitement. Okay. And that they're doing that because they're trying to sell ads. I get it. Okay. If they were managing money, they would, they would not be doing that. <laughs> Because it creates the uh, the fear of missing out is a real um, psychological uh, phenomenon that people have to deal with. It, they they call it FOMO. They've even reduced it to that, but fear of missing out. And when you tell people, hey, yeah, well, yeah, the market's making a new high for the year, but the actual high was in December of 2022. And what year is it again? Yeah, it's 2023. <laughs> and it's not back to that level that it was in 2022. Not only is it not back to that level, it was down more than almost 30% in the meantime. And they don't, they don't care that this is upsetting you. Uh, actually, they like to get a, a, an emotional response because when people are emotional, they have a tendency to make bad decisions. And uh, um, their goal is to get your attention, not to help you invest. So just so you know that, when you're t- most uh, financial publications, most financial programs are not done by people who like me who actually help people manage their money, they're done by people who are selling products. And that's why they're doing it. So you kind of have to you have to know that. And uh, I'm selling a product too. My product is service, and we're a fiduciary, uh, which I would I would I would be a fiduciary even if it weren't required. <laughs> but and I was, but I would put the fiduciary oath long before they made it a requirement. And this is going back twenty something years ago. So the fiduciary status, you know, a lot of brokerage firms really hemmed and hauled around that for a long time. And a lot of them still don't hold their representatives accountable to that. And, and, you know, that's their business. I'm sure they've got their reasons. And there are probably some good reasons out there, too. I should say that. But bottom line is I want to know somebody's looking out for me. You know, hey, Bill, if you were me, what would you do? Well, Knowing about your background, knowing about uh, your finances, and that's one of the things that we have to know. I get a lot of people, by the way, who call in and ask questions uh, and don't want to give up any information. Well, that's like going into the doctor and saying, hey, doctor, I need you to heal me. I'm sick. Well, what are your symptoms? Well, I'm not going to tell you. (laughs) It is the same thing. And uh, uh, I don't get that as much now because I think, you know, the public has come a long way. Uh, a lot of their understanding is significantly better than it was 10 or 15 years ago, and I thank the Internet for that. But um, but the, the amount of options that are out there, it has, it, it, it's just grown incredibly. And it just blows my mind, the growth in the financial services industry. And they're constantly bringing out new products. I mean, it, it is extremely exhausting reading all that stuff. And then you find out, oh, okay, yeah, no, that, that, they're just calling, this is the same uh, concept as it, it's been around for 10 or 15 years. They're making a minor change and calling it something new. So uh, that part of it is a, uh, um, it's a lot of effort. But And I, I would pity the people that are trying to have a normal life, that have a normal job and uh, are trying to keep up with this. Is, uh, I do it full time for a living, and I'm going to tell you it's pretty tough. So, in any way, I've got these uh, products, by the way, that make it easier and uh, a lot easier, actually. And one of them is a, a product called uh, Telechart, and it'll show you which sectors are doing well. It, it'll do a lot of things. It, it's mainly for scanning. 
uh, for investment opportunities. And uh, I'm going to come back to this in just a little bit. Actually, I'll come back to this for the last 15 minutes of the show so we can talk about some individual stocks. I used to do more for clients in that area. Uh, I just won't do it anymore. It's it's too hard. The market moves too fast. Um, I have to have discretion on the accounts, which means I'm going to be buying and selling without calling. Uh, and I just I really prefer having an organized fund doing the things that I used to do. And that's a lot of them do. And I'm going to tell you this: there, you hear a lot of stuff about factor investing. And I hate when they put a new term on something old. What What's a factor? Well, it, it's just some sort of uh, characteristic that a stock has. A, a factor could be, well, the sales have got to be growing um, by X percent. Or, in most cases, sales are growing in the top 10% of, of all companies that are publicly traded. That would be called a factor. Why am I bringing that one up? Because the sales growth is actually the most influential factor if you look out over an extremely long time period. Okay? So, and it makes sense. I mean, if how do you grow the business value if you're not growing their sales? I mean, you can't. So, I mean, you can temporarily. You can cut your costs. You know, maybe you, you bought a piece of property and were able to sell it for a big bunch of money. But that doesn't have anything to do with your business. <laughs> eventually, you're going to have to find a way to grow your sales. And I just can't believe how many people don't get that. I I talk to people all the time. Well, why is that important? Oh, wow. I mean, think about it. If Quaker Oats uh, hadn't increased the amount of their sales that they've had. Now, by the way, you can increase sales two ways. You can sell more product, obviously, or you can raise prices. Either way, you're generating more income. And again, that's something you need to take a look at. If you don't want to take a look at it, you need to know that that's out there, that it's a component of the funds that you're investing in because in the long run, it's going to matter. In the short run, it's not going to matter so much. In the short run, anything less than four or five years, that's what, you know, that's what kills everybody. They think the long run is six weeks. <laughs> and that'll hurt you. That's really going to hurt you. But the uh, the long run is really five to ten years. You know, if you go back five years ago, hey, let me see. We're going to go back to 2018. I'm looking at the Russell Wall of 3,000. Okay? And five years ago, it's up about 48% from five years ago. Okay? It's still below where it was in uh, uh, December of 2021. We are August of 2023. That's not quite two years, but a a year and a half, and you're still below that level. So people that don't have access to these types of tools, they don't know that thing. They don't know that. They get upset because they think they're doing more poorly than they are, and, uh, and they will change. Now, if you were, let's say you were cut in half, over that time period, your, your portfolio went down by half and, and you never made it back. That's poor performance. The fact that you might not have not might not be back to your all-time high is not poor performance because almost nothing is at its all-time high. Does that make sense? I should be getting a, a, some thank you uh, emails from other financial planners out there for talking about this. <laughs> Because I know we all go through the same stuff. And uh, by the way, that's, that is hilarious. I, and I am not competitive as far as that goes. Um, I think you need to find someone that you like, that you th- think a lot like, and because uh, you, you need to get along. Markets are incredibly volatile, incredibly volatile. And it just helps to have somebody on the same page that thinks similarly to the way that you think and can reinforce, you know, this is why we're doing it. Uh, don't worry about it. Yeah, let's just keep, you know, if we really need to make an adjustment, then we're going to need to make an adjustment. But but most of the time, the adjustments that people are, are reacting to are what's ever happened in the market in the last few months. And 
you know, there were some there are times when that worked out really well and I know earlier in my career I think the uh uh all through the 90s I mean it was yeah through the 90s a lot of people listening today probably weren't even born then <laughs> but it was a lot easier uh there were some things that you could do to kind of follow trends that that worked very very well and they still work but they don't work nearly as well as they used to because the market's whole structure has changed. And uh, we'll talk about that on a future show. But just for today, just know that the market structure has changed significantly. And uh, I'm not sure that looking at a market cap weighted index is a good thing to do. I think if you look at an equally weighted index, you're probably going to get a better idea of what's happening. And uh, now that I mentioned that, I don't have time to explain that on today's show. I'm sorry about that. But you can always call me, and uh, I can go over it with you over in a phone call. You know, if you're a client out there, yeah, I get a ton of calls from my clients that, that still listen to the show, and uh, uh, which I think is, you know, it, it makes me feel good. Uh, I really, really like my client base, and uh, I get some really good questions. Um, I've learned a whole lot more because of the questions that they've had. Uh, I, I get curious about, and then I'll go look up the answers. So that works out really well. And I just want to uh, go through my notes back here. Oh, yeah. Um, so we talked about somebody who was going to be full Social Security age next year and wanted some guaranteed income. And so for every 100000 the really, reason I use 100000 is because in percentage, if you, if you put a hundred thousand in and you get seven thousand one hundred fifty-four dollars, well, that's seven point one five four percent on the hundred thousand today. Now you waited a year for that, so that calculation is not actually seven point one five four percent because you missed that one year of uh, that first year. You have to wait before you can turn the income on, but it is seven point one. Uh, 5% of 100000 That's just not the, rate, rate, the actual rate of return that you get. It's slightly lower than that because you had to wait for 12 months. Still, that's that's pretty good. And if you put it off for another year, it goes to 9600 If you uh, – I'm sorry. No, it doesn't go to 9600 It goes to 7800 <laughs> Wow, I wish it went to 9600 You put it off for another year after that, it goes to 8500 Put it off for another year, goes to 92. So this is something that is really uh, good to think about, even if you're already retired. I would say that I would start thinking along these lines as a replacement for fixed income in your portfolio, uh, like regular old bonds. The uh, uh, I would start looking at it seriously when I got into my 50s. Uh, that gives you a lot of time, and even all the way up into somebody's, you know, in their 70s or 80s. Uh, if you take a whatever your income is for the next 12 months, put that in a money market account and just use it to supplement your income until this income kicks in, and you can get a uh, uh, somebody that he, oh it doesn't uh, he doesn't I don't think they do it at age 80. This one I think is 75 or 76. Yeah, okay. So if you're gonna do it at age 76. The uh, uh, income on that is fifteen thousand five ninety six on a hundred thousand. That's that's pretty good. That's really good. So I just uh, I've been told I've got about sixty seconds before my commercial break is coming up here, and uh, so I'm just going to put my name out there again. It's Bill Bullington. Um, you can go to my website bullingtoncapital.com if you'd like to reach out and ask any questions that you'd like to have answered. And uh, I'm going to take a real quick commercial break, and when we come back, we'll talk about, we'll finish the conversation on individual stocks and uh, open up for questions. 216 901 0945. Yeah, everybody hurts sometimes, I know that's what they say. But right now it seems this loneliness won't go away. Yeah. Can anybody feel this heartache? Is anyone around? Feels like we're running round in circles, we can't catch a breath. A thousand generations. Well, welcome back. Hey, this is Bill Bullington. 
I'm here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon. You can reach me by going to my website at bullingtoncapital.com. If you have a question on anything you hear on this program, feel free to email me at bill at bullington.com. I just said the, uh, my website was Bill at Bullington. That was my email address. <laughs> it's, it's just Bullington Capital is the, the website address. Um, at any rate, you know, we were talking a little bit about the economy. The economy is incredibly resilient, by the way. I mean, I, I can't believe with the, the pandemic that we went through that it didn't drop more than it did. And it still hasn't recovered fully because you've got a uh, um, supply chain issue with Europe. A lot of stuff came through Europe, and uh, we did a lot of business with a lot of those countries, and, and a lot of them are, well, Ukraine shut down completely. So it's a, uh, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with resiliency. And what I see going forward is, uh, you know, stocks are going to fluctuate a lot. They always do. They always have. And when you get closer to retirement, you probably want to start cutting back a little bit on your exposure. And I think I'm actually at a point where I'm about a 70-30, which is the, um, um, the most in fixed income I've ever held, which is kind of interesting. And uh, uh, But, you know, I'm 60 now. So that's seven years before I'm eligible for full Social Security. And uh, I still have great confidence in the economy. I really like what I see happening behind the scenes. Uh, the technology companies have been on fire, and they're the ones that have been supporting the rest of the stock market uh, because their growth rates are so high. And uh, this AI thing is is uh, it, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's going to make a big difference someday. Um, it's making a kind of a difference now. It just makes some things a little bit easier. Not Not too much, though. Uh, it's still too complicated for the general public to get a lot of use out of it yet, but it is coming. And I don't know if you remember, but uh, when we were talking about electric cars, you know, way before Tesla and uh, way before they got to be very popular. But anyway, I have a caller right now, and uh, I didn't get the name of the caller, so I guess I'll let you introduce yourself. Oh, Walter. So, Walter. You're on the Bullington Capital Report. Hey, Bill. Uh, got three questions you? for you. Okay. First one um, is about Carl Icahn and his investment, uh, I think is IEP, the symbols. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's okay. really taken a big hit lately. And uh, it was disclosed that he did a short um, back a few years ago, and he lost $4.8 billion. And I just wanted, to, and they said that he didn't do it with any safeguards. Did he breach any fiduciary duty by doing that? You would have to read uh, his memoring, uh, offering, offering memorandum. And that's kind of a, a prospectus for a hedge fund, which is how he was structured. And if he says he can do that in there, there's nothing you can do about it because he disclosed it. And, so as uh, long as he discloses it, it's okay. Yeah. Yep, absolutely, oh. and that's why. Yeah, that's why hedge funds are. are uh, they call them accredited investors. You, you, they're um, limited to investment by accredited investors. Accredited investors supposedly somebody who uh, knows something about money. And what's really funny is though the guidelines are if you have two million dollars. That makes you an accredited investor because I guess the logic was when they passed these laws that uh, if you, you couldn't get $2 million if you weren't smart. So that makes every lottery winner and every professional athlete an, a genius. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I was laughing. But the, uh, and guys like Carl Icahn, yeah, he's old. And uh, that dude, I can see him taking a lot of risk. I mean, he's already – so wealthy, it's not going to change his yeah, life one way or another. Yeah, the risk doesn't hurt him, but it hurts the people who are invested okay. with him, you know? Yeah. Yep. That's and, the thing. and unfortunately, yeah, you, you got to know, you know, that that's why they want people, 
the rule of the accredited investor, it, most people that have accumulated $2 million probably have pretty good financial sense. So I, I get it. But you have to know, because it, in those hedge funds, it's buyer beware. And, uh, you know, Warren Buffett, <laughs> when the market was dropping uh, around the housing crisis, he comes in and sells a billion dollars worth of puts on the S&P 500, and then it goes down another 12, 12, uh, 25%. And selling puts is one of the riskiest things you can do. It ends up costing him over a billion dollars. And now he just laughed about it because that's just a small percentage of his you know, total net worth. But a billion dollars. <laughs> and... Uh, it to lose it that quickly, doing something that is totally out of his um, normal business uh, operations, the, uh, I was just like, wow. You know, he was, uh, of course, he's, all, he's got a lot of faith in the U.S. economy, good reason. And uh, But uh, he thought that, man, the market can't go down much more than this right before it did. <laughs> uh, and, next uh, question. But, uh, uh, yep. There's talk about um, the Republicans are uh, for Social Security uh, reform that they want to put 75% of Social Security in a sovereign wealth fund. Isn't that risky Good luck. to put something in a market-driven system when people are collecting Social yeah. Security and they don't have that much time to raise? Yeah, I don't think they'll ever get that passed. Yeah, that that won't get through. There, there are still a lot of smart people in Congress, and there are a ton of smart people that work for the Fed. There's a uh, to, to get that through all of those people, uh, you know, and, and to me, that's probably on the internet what they refer to as clickbait a lot of times because they know stories like that are upsetting, and people will stop and read something like that. And uh, so they get to sell the ads to everybody that advertised on that page where that story showed up. And that's the thing you got to keep in mind. Um, you know, advertising or journalism. It's just, that's what freaks me out. I mean, I, I took journalism when I was in high school and I took a course in college. And, you know, back in those days, you had to have a, a pretty good uh, idea that whatever the data that you're using or referring to was real and legitimate. And boy, those standards have really gone down a lot. Uh, so you just have to be so careful when you're reading this stuff. I don't believe anything unless I can get four or five uh, companies who have good reputations that are supporting it. And even then, uh, you know, they've known, been known to be wrong. But I just wouldn't I wouldn't pay too much attention to what you see or hear unless you've got a lot of time to really go and research what what it is exactly that they're saying. And the other thing is that people uh, uh, don't realize that a lot of people that are writing for these financial publications are journalists. They're not economists. They're not financiers. You know, they're journalists. And yeah, they've probably picked up a lot of uh, knowledge over the years, but it, it's not their main, not the main thing that they do to uh, produce a living for themselves. They're out there writing on stuff that they've got to get attention. It's got to be read for them to get paid, because it, again, it goes back to the number of views uh, that uh, are seen on the internet. But let's see, uh, uh, it, it's a tough situation all the way around. But yeah, an accredited investor can invest the money in something like Carl, Carl Icahn's funds. And that's how Warren Buffett started out, by the way. He had a, uh, he was a hedge fund. And uh, he called it, he always referred to it, refers to it as a limited partnership. They're uh, basically, Basically the same thing, and he got four uh, percent. I think four percent of the no above four percent. I can't even remember now. It was twenty five percent of the profit. I think it was above four percent, or it was above the treasury rate, or something like that. So his big gains actually came from the portion of the profits that he got from the people from a lot of the people that he was managing money for, and it allowed him. He, he did so well. It allowed him to start buying companies completely, <laughs> right? And then he gets to control where the cash goes. He, that, how genius, you know? He's really a, a big part of the cause of 
with the modern development of finance. And uh, it's mind-boggling. But um, one one thing, whenever I uh, read something in Yahoo Finance, they always have like a hedge fund. They always have billionaire hedge fund. And you have, you know, they don't tell you how he became a billionaire. You know, he could have inherited it or whatever. You know, that was right. yep. oh, I... is, you know. Well, you know, the biggest producers at at big firms, big brokerage firms, have a tendency to come from families who are really wealthy. Yeah, you <laughs> think, like... yeah, that's the thing. They don't tell you that, and you they they right. make it act like he got it from investing, and therefore they know something. You know. Right. Yeah, I know. It's yeah, uh, it's tough. You got to do a lot of research on anything. I don't care what it is. When it comes to money, you better check three times. I I go to minimally three sources that will verify something um, before I will even start to talk about something that I think might be interesting. But Carl Icahn's got a real nice website. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, his, his stock has crashed. You know, oh man, you know. Oh yeah. I, I hope there's a lawsuit there because, to me, that's just wrong what he did. You know, um, you know, it may not well, be see, illegal, but that doesn't make it, yeah. you know, right. You know. Well, if it, it yeah, it, it's why you have to read and be aware of the risks. I mean, that that guy had carried such a concentrated portfolio, and and he was always taking big risks, and you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of them paid off. And that, that's how he got to be as successful as he is. But sooner or later, man, <laughs> risk is a double-edged sword. And, right. uh, you'll see both sides of it if you stay there long enough. But, yeah. but I've only got about 15 seconds. i gotta, I got to run. And, uh, Thanks I for the information. I appreciate you calling in. Oh, no problem. Have a good weekend. And uh, to everybody else out there, uh, good luck and good investing. Just caught another edition of the Bullington Capital Report, broadcasting every Saturday at 11 a.m. on AM 1420, The Answer. If you have a question and you'd like to speak to Bill personally, you can call him at 330-664-0700. That's 330-664-0700. Or online at BullingtonCapital.com. That's BullingtonCapital.com. The preceding program has been paid for by Bullington Capital Management, LLC.